saying this is the last day, LACNOC 2024. Let's go on with, the LAC, with uh, our agenda. It's very interesting uh, to come to Wi-Fi 6 uh, by Wi-Fi 7. Uh, ad advances and technological impacts. Luis Cosme Pupin is an expert in communication networks with over 20 years experience. He's been a pioneer in technologies such as MPLS and BGP and uh, network security. He has a vast experience and I'm sure that he will give us a uh, knowledgeable um, perspective uh, of uh, the <coughs> technologies. <coughs> Good morning. The, the purpose of this presentation is to discuss the new technologies that were introduced by Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7. Wi-Fi 7 is a standard that has not been ratified. It has not been signed. And there there are products that are being sold and marketed even in Brazil. In recent weeks, we had a university 100% implemented with our Wi-Fi 7. It's already been delivered to their networks. And the idea here is to show you all the new things about these two families of protocols. I come. Well, here, let me introduce myself. This is a summarized uh, curriculum working with uh, Wi-Fi. I've been working with Wi-Fi for a long time, implementing uh, networks uh, um, I, with the, I, the only one uh, with starting already in 1997. One of the big problems that they had with Wi-Fi was always the obstacle of density, the volume of people connected to uh, uh, so just to be able to uh, give service to a larger number of uh, people. We needed more devices with more uh, points of access, and that worsened the network. And it was always an obstacle for so for, uh, so density was always a problem for Wi-Fi. So with this presentation, we want to show that uh, Wi-Fi six and seven, what they bring, what uh, they contribute with. Uh, so uh, allowing us to have a much better development in terms of density, offering more uh, connectivity to people, and uh, solving many uh, uh, obstacles for higher performance environments. So first of all, let us uh, talk about uh, the evolution of Wi-Fi. Why do we have uh, these new families, and why is there such a fast evolution? Here we have uh, the history in time from uh, its origin in 1997, 900 megahertz, uh, 802, 11. There were no letters yet. In 1999, A and B, and then in uh, 2003, uh, G. There was not much new in A, B, G. Basically, it gave us a very limited connectivity, and the uh, idea of those first families, they were intended not to replace uh, the cable, but rather the contrary. The idea was to provide some mobility to our clients. The uh, connectivities had very uh, little uh, bandwidth, only 52 megas in A and B. And at, the, at that time, the implementations where I worked were meant uh, to uh, meeting rooms. Uh, the official would leave uh, uh, their uh, table with their, where they had their uh, desktop and went to another meeting where they needed connectivity. So it was uh, not something like an advanced uh, homing. It, not, and um, nothing as advanced as this. 
the person would walk around in the room. So in uh, 2009, we had the first uh, deployment of a memo. We don't have much time, so we won't go too much in depth. But it suffices to say that memo was a solution that uh, started using the multiple paths uh, that uh, the previous uh, generations had had problems with, uh, with uh, where there were many different paths in the, the previous generations that was considered an interference. Now, MIMO enabled the use of those paths to expand the, uh, uh, the bandwidth. So, with these families, this provided greater mobility. My customers should disconnect from one cable and use Wi-Fi in a specific, specific environment. So this allowed me to go out into the corridors and have coverage. So this led to the concept of bring your own device, BYOD. So it was at the time when we implemented that. Later on, Wi-Fi 5 extended the array of options. We now have the to Higas from 1999 to 2023, we went from megas to two gigabyte capacity. Now, however, customers become more and more demanding. They want to have more and more bandwidth. So we started with the Wi-5-6 families in 2019, and in 2023, we had the Wi-5-7. One of the things that we noted along this path was the emergence for high speed for IoT and with low latency. So what we started to note was that IoT projects wanted to have indoor 5G solutions due to the high reliability and low latency provided by 5G. So we had this indoor environment that was dominated by Wi-Fi. It was replaced by 5G, which had been planned for outdoor environments. And this didn't manage to achieve the required low latency for some of the applications. Now, with Wi-Fi 6 and with Wi-Fi 7, I will show, show you these technologies afterwards, shows how we come closer to these high reliability and low latency solutions that are provided by 5G to IoT. Whereas in the previous families, one sought to increase the bandwidth Solutions five and so, uh, sorry six and seven have the main goal of providing IoT connectivity. So, focusing on these technologies to provide solutions to the IoT market, and quite obviously, bandwidth continues to increase. Now, what are these technologies? <laughs> the first technology that we saw in Y57 was the five gigahertz band. So this had already foreseen deployment until the five to five gigahertz. Some of the manufacturers ignored this and to develop products for this Wi-Fi option and then went to over to seven. These are standards that were very close to one another and for commercial reasons. The deployment of five Z and five and seven Z. So so why six gigahertz? This is a new range for Wi-Fi, so it's very limited external interference of non-Wi-Fi devices. This allows us to have a, much, a far better performance. 
with a bandwidth of 1.2 gigahertz available to be used. So we see that with Wi-Fi 7, we can use 320 megahertz channels. This allows us to have a very significant bandwidth for transfers. We will also see in the widest ch channel, canal, we can have greater simultaneity in the same environment, and this provides a solution in the high-density environment that we had in at the beginning. Now, why implementing the 320 megahertz canal in Wi-Fi 7? We see here that the supported channel bandwidth is multiplied so that we can achieve the Wi-Fi speed. So I can increase the number and the subcarriers, which will then lead to a greater bandwidth. With the 120 megahertz canal, Wi-Fi 7 already has the option of having 27 gigabits per second. So this makes them available to be divided among all the clients that are connected. One of the further solutions deployed are a large number of bits per symbol, whereas in Wi-Fi 5, we had 256 QAM with only 8 bits per symbol. In the case of Wi-Fi 6, this was increased to 10 bits per single, and Wi-Fi 7 to 4,096 QAM, or 12 bits per symbol. So you can see here the constellation of the symbols. This is just a representation. It's not absolutely uh, exactly like this, but it shows us that when increasing the symbol constellation, the number of bits per symbol, this becomes far more intolerant to interferences. In order to reach the theoretical 27 gigas offered by Wi-Fi 7, I need to have a very silent environment with very, very low interference. So then I therefore need to be able to use the 4,096. So my question is, with a larger amount of bits, does this guarantee a better performance? If we increase only two bits, we'll have 25% improvement. If in Wi-Fi 6, I had 12 and a half, this won't allow me to reach that goal. So the higher the bits per symbol, the worse will my capacity be the intolerance to interference. So we cannot solve things with Wi-5.7 and think that the network will be faster just because we have deployed it. So we're going to use Wi-5.7 for other solutions, for other technologies that are incorporated. Now, in the environment where Wi-5.6 does not manage to achieve a big bandwidth, we'll have the same problem with Wi-5.7 if the obstacle is the interference. I believe that one of the issues planning at Wi-Fi network is precisely this. We don't have a solution that figures out the solution to the half-duplex issue. One speaks, everyone keeps quiet, the AP once again speaks, and you have to keep quiet to listen to the AP. So this is a shared environment. This is different to fiber or to cable, where each has its own spectrum and frequency. This is the same shared frequency here. I have I'm going to take that frequency band. I'm going to divide it by 
customers and each has a time slot to speak. This does not occur simultaneously. Simultaneity is not allowed, but it's only allowed by the multiplexation that we'll do in that environment. This is OFDMA. This is one of the new things that were introduced by Wi-Fi 6 and were improved better with Wi-Fi 7. OFDMA was deployed with the SMDA standard to 11A. Now, very rapidly, the great advantage of OFDM is that it takes the super wide canal of 22 megahertz, for example, of the 20 megas from the Wi Fi, and this is broken down into several subcarriers. And prior to OFDM, I had a truck that occupied the entire road, uh, the path, and it could only carry one user at a time. Now, with OFDMA, I take that road and I put a small truck for each user, so I load less amount of information, but this information belongs to more users at the same time. I know it is slower, but it does not stop. So you can send more information simultaneously from several users and not just information from one user. Now, what was the new introduction of Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7? The major difference was that these two, the new thing of OFGMA is a great introduction. So instead of having one truck per client, each truck has divisions. So I could put pieces of information from different clients in the same truck, in the same subcarrier. Let us now have a look at the difference between Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7. Precisely this has to do with that division inside the truck. If in the past I had a small truck per user, now each truck might have information from one user at the same time. Now what would be these divisions in the truck, in this subcarrier? These are these, it's these units, the resource units, these are time intervals contained in those carriers. Now, what is the difference between Wi-Fi 6, that has FMDA, and in Wi-Fi 6, each user can have just one of these units from each subcarrier. Therefore, we have a le less users than these units multiplied by the subcarriers. So the users that have information to convey have to wait that time interval for their next transmission in order to have more transmission space. As a result, we can say, for example, can we pass information from 52 users simultaneously, but we only have 40. Therefore, all these units, all that uh, are sort of wasted because each of the units can be included for each subcarrier, even if we have more information to transmit. So what did Wi-Fi 7 do? This is something that we call multiple users units. So here in this graph, you can see that in Wi-Fi 6, we have white squares that were being uh, not wasted. But the yellow users and the blue users have more information to transmit. So these spaces that are, were wasted can now be used. In practice, what does this mean? This leads to the fact that in the case of Wi-Fi 5, we have 20 to 25 milliseconds latency by air, and we had an o pure OFDM. Now, in the case of OFDMA, this was lowered to 10 milliseconds with, with Wi-Fi 6 and OFDMA with multiple users you know this was lowered to five milliseconds you will recall that i said that some iot solutions are now starting to use 5g indoors due to the low latency of 5g so wi-fi 7 is now 
almost reaching the latency of 5G and allows the implementation of some Wi-Fi solutions in order for, for IoT that leads very low frequency, latency, sorry. The last solution that uh, we brought here is multi-link, all multiple link. This is another characteristic that uh, we didn't used to have until we had the Wi-Fi 6. And in the case of Wi-Fi 6, we would connect 2.4, 5, or 6. Uh, we uh, would uh, connect in one of these bands, frequency bands, and the client usually had to, to choose. They tend to choose the best frequency with the best uh, signal to noise ratio. In the case of Wi-Fi 7, we, we can have a multi-link, that is, that we can connect in more than one of these uh, frequency bands, and we can choose whether we want to do it load balance between the different uh, uh, frequency bands, uh, increasing that ratio, or whether we want redundancy. We are going to choose the best frequency, and uh, if uh, it crashes, then we don't have to wait. Now, what happens when we are there? We are uh, connected to uh, Wi-Fi 6 with 5 giga, and then we lose that. It stops, and then it connects to 2.4, and then we start uh, the trans retransmission. But with Wi-Fi 7, the client can be connected to multiple uh, bands. And as um, if it loses one connection, it's already connected to uh, the other one. So now I'm going to present uh, three uh, apps. Uh, these are apps that are possible thanks to um, the uh, characteristics of Wi-Fi 7. First of all, at offices, in, in uh, um, education centers, and in stadiums. I, I think that the best uh, advantage of Wi-Fi 6 or 7 uh, is seen at a stadium. If you have worked at home like this, you know that it's horrible to, to be connecting many, many people in the same uh, room. With Wi-Fi 6, but now even more so with Wi-Fi 7, it's become much more or simple. I won't say it's perfect. We still have some problems. As a matter of fact, we are already working in for Wi-Fi 8 because in, by 2030 we will have Wi-Fi 8, and increasingly we're trying to solve this problem. However, nothing compares to what happened in 2014 when I was designing the a project of the stadiums for the World Cup in 2014, and we knew it wouldn't work, and we knew that it was going to be no good. Wi-Fi was a solution that would not uh, we would be unable to cover that space. We could uh, go from 80 to 120 users with Wi-Fi 7 for reach ratio. Now let's see a space where you have a quality inspection in a factory. There are high resolution changes, many monitoring uh, cameras, and we could go from 10 to 30 gigas. And here, let me, uh, a word of caution. In uh, that perfect space that we considered where there's almost no interference, from the theoretical point of view, we can reach 30. But we're already increasing the bandwidth for these spaces for quality control. And then at a factory, for instance, a manufacturing company, I, I was talking about uh, the indoor IoT, those robots that uh, leave uh, the premises uh, to take uh, the pallets uh, um, and uh, for storage, and uh, th there's a latency that we achieved with with Wi-Fi 7. We got to five milliseconds in the air. Now, of course, what's a pro what was the problem of Wi-Fi? We think of a fiber network highly optimized with uh, barely one millisecond from the terminal to the server, and then when we saw the Wi-Fi, actually, we would add uh, 20 milliseconds because of the Wi-Fi itself. So Wi-Fi 7 brings this new thing, a much smaller latency. My apologies. <clears throat> Here you have my contact data. I'll be available for you if you want to discuss anything further. Of course, Wi-Fi 7 is much more than what I said here in five uh, seconds. I really 
summarized it, but uh, this is just as a reference. The book that I used uh, to prepare this uh, uh, presentation was 180 pages long, so imagine this is a summary. But uh, I invite you to learn more about this, especially if you work with Wi-Fi. I think that what I brought is a very interesting thing if you want to go more in-depth into this topic. Hello, good morning. I'm Juan Carlos Marquez from Cavase, the Argentine uh, Internet uh, uh, Chamber. I'm going to ask a question in Spanish. First of all, Luis, I want to thank you because uh, you were uh, very, um, it was um, very good. I wanted to ask you whether it's going to be made available in the agenda, but my question has to do with the following, and I might not be willing to listen to the response. What a headache for uh, 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 one of the headaches of ISP is how to improve the quality of Wi-Fi within the FHT8. What do you th consider that will be the contribution of Wi-Fi 7 in solving that problem? All right. Well, indeed, as a matter of fact, it is one of the big headaches because a space with so many barriers that we cannot control. And as a matter of fact, it's much easier to work uh, 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 at a plant, at a manufacturing plant, than uh, in a home. We have some things that have already been implemented, but especially in the spaces where we have more than one point of access, we see that much of the evolution of Wi-Fi is focused on uh, the corporate world, uh, corporate market. So when you say we have to be careful with interference, for instance, basically, the new thing about uh, uh, how to uh, um, address interferences in a corporate world where we have many points of access and sometimes you have to um, interpolate. One of the things that improved with Wi-Fi 6 is a technology that I didn't include in the presentation because I wanted it to be faster, but we can take a channel and that can send a signal that is called color, and we can, we can even have another point of access in the same channel, and our client may no longer listen to that point of access and uh, only to follow the point of access uh, they're connected to. That is called VS coloring in Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7, and that reduces the interference. For instance, my neighbor is, list, is using my same channel and sort of reduces it, but it's not a final solution. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Julio Cirota of NECBR, and my question is uh, actually whether you could give us your view of how is the dispute of uh, the 6 gigahertz channel in Brazil? Because we are trying to divide it between Wi-Fi 7 and wireless 5G. And I'd like to know what would be, what impact this would have in technology if that separation were to be approved. In Brazil, a, there is a public hearing ongoing. It was opened on 6 gigahertz. Anatel, that is the National Telecom uh, Agency of Brazil, opened this panel using the entire band from 5900 to 6120, uh, uh, more or less. I don't remember exactly all the numbers. But this uh, um, band of, uh, was released in America, and then Anatel also did it in Europe generated a rupture in the first 500 megahertz for Wi-Fi 7 and the 600 remaining hertz for the 5G environment. This public hearing was done, it was closed, it was reopened, but no final decision was made. But we are going to lose a lot in channeling. For instance, if we have a 320 megahertz channel, we are going to have four 320 megahertz channel in a complete uh, band of these five gig, six gigas. So if we do it the way we are planning it, we're going to have only one 320 channel. So for instance, if we want to implement a back hole, black hole between an access point, we have a mesh network, and we want to do that. Between two, we'll have one channel to work in this environment, and we would have interferences, and we would lose in terms of quality. 
Therefore, we will lose a bit of flexibility with uh, Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7 if this decision is made. Um, hello. Well, first of all, thank you for this presentation. It was very interesting and just the same as the, the, the person who asked the first uh, question, I would love to receive your presentation. My question has to do, for instance, at present, when we use, for instance, 811AC at home, for instance, I have a 200 mega with a fiber, um, and but when I go, when I work, if I am in my in the living room close to the modem with Wi-Fi, then I do get 200, and sometimes even a bit more. But if I go to, up, if I go upstairs, my bedroom, and considering that my house is house is very small, I have 20 to 30 megas, so there's a huge. Uh, performance loss. Now, in the previous standards, as far as I understand it, when they were not capable of modulating the signal with enough quality of a quality to noise uh, uh, signal to noise uh, ratio, they it went to a more robust connection, but slower. You explained that with Wi-Fi 6 and 7, we are going to be permanently connected to all the frequency channels. So my specific question would be, whether that will make it possible to avoid such huge variations because of the natural attenuations of walls uh, inside the houses, that is, going from 200 megas to 35, as, we, as is currently the case. So that's my question. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned, Wi-Fi 5 had uh, oh, oh, a bad thing, and that it is all, it only used the five gigahertz uh, band, n it, n and it had not uh, anticipated the use of 2.4. So when you are closer to the point of access, you can connect with five gigas. There's a theoretical speed of up to 2.1 gigas of connectivity with Wi-Fi 5. So when you go upstairs, we switch to 2.4 or less, and we go to 200, uh, 12N. So we only have 600 mega as the bandwidth. So Wi-Fi 5 had that problem. And precisely, that's one of the reasons uh, that uh, gave rise to Wi-Fi 6. And Wi-Fi 7 already brings all of these frequency bands. It is very likely that, well, indeed, in the implementation of Wi-Fi 7, we'll be able to have this multiple link. And hence, when uh, you go upstairs to your bedroom, you won't notice this change or this uh, lack of connection and connection. In the case of Wi-Fi 6, for instance, when we have 5 gigahertz, we can reach 9.1 gigas of bandwidth, and in 2.4, we can get to 2.2 gigas of bandwidth. So if we have 200 megas of link, probably you won't notice that difference when you are connected in 5 gigahertz or in 2.4. This difference, in theory, would not be perceived. Thank you, Luis. For your experience and your knowledge about the new Wi-Fi technologies, thank you for your time and thank you for such important contributions. Once again, a round of applause for him.